travelers and welcome to versus stars podcast how my loyal listeners thank you for continued support and remember click the subscribe button everybody it's an amazing episode because size spurrier boards the mothership we talked to flash from dc comics come aboard you're traversing the stars hello mr spurrier thanks so much for coming to versus stars podcast thank you for having me so my pleasure a big fan of your work and i can't wait to talk to flash with you so I always start with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of comics and who are earliest influences? Oh, uh, I came to comics quite late, um, notwithstanding, you know, the sort of what I would refer to as as kind of kids comedy comics, the sort of cartoony things. Um, I guess I guess I probably was exposed to those when I was very wee. But then it wasn't until I was like 16 that I kind of stumbled upon um I think it was Judge Dredd versus Batman, uh, mm-hmm. Judgment on Gotham. So Simon Bisley, um, you know, the sort of extremely hench, muscular, painty vibe at a time when I was very into creative writing and art. And it, and I guess it just sort of altered my preconceived notions of what comics were or could be and, and made me think, hang on a minute, I, this deserves a bit more attention. So that's that's sort of where the immediate interest came from. Being an arrogant little fuck, age 16, I thought, well, hey, if if this stuff makes me happy, then I can do it better than anybody else and and sort of set out to prove that and, and failed miserably for a few years uh, until my my submissions to 2000 AD started getting some traction. And, and they started getting traction specifically, to your point, when I began to pay attention to other creators who have since become my sort of guiding lights um no great surprise dreadful cliche but alan moore was was sort of the first and greatest and remains the first and greatest there are loads of others uh in writerly terms john wagner i think doesn't get nearly enough press in the us he he can do things with pacing that i don't think any other creators can do garth ennis somebody who who sort of um just made me howl with laughter from the very beginning and and what's really lovely about my very slow trajectory towards where I'm getting to now is that along the way I've met a lot of these people as a fan and they have since become very close friends you know Alan and I have hung out a great many times and he's just the most astonishing like this uh, when you you know there's an old cliche about when you hang out with stupid people you get a stupid contact you know like you come yeah. away from it a bit dumber than you were before alan's the opposite you spend any time with him and you come away feeling clever and erudite and you choose your words with clear with care and you feel like you've sort of been infected by deep thought in some way whereas like garth is one of my closest friends now we hang out a lot and he's just the most loyal wonderful thoughtful generous but it's incredible this privilege of meeting your heroes and to not have them turn out to be pricked (laughs) (laughs) warned never to meet them but nine times out of ten in this industry they are heroes because they understand something about the human condition they 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 don't have any airs and graces i tend to be drawn to creators like there's there's two sorts of creators i think this is more true of writers than is of artists but there's writers who stand in front of their work and there's writers who stand behind their work. And I'm always drawn to those who stand behind the work. It's not about them. It's not about brand. It's not about what fucking clothes they wear or what they said on Twitter yesterday. It's about the work and having something to say rather than having something to prove. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a very long winded way of of saying it was sort of Alan from the very beginning and all those kind of 2080 guys. And I've continued to follow them as we we sort of spread towards the US side of things. Um, yeah, that's that's my answer, long as it was. Now, now you do have me curious a little bit about um, Alan Moore a little bit. Um, Alan Moore has had an interesting relation with comic books over recent memories because of some issues that he's had with uh, Corporation, uh, DC, things of that nature. Having talked to him and kind of get a deeper insight into those situations, how has that maybe informed you about maybe your own relationships with comic book company and culture as a whole? I mean, it's it's a good question. I'm I'm not going to pretend that I can speak for Alan before before sort of getting into my own side of that question. Um, 
he he has uh, as as we all know you know we've all read interviews he has uh, a lot of very complex and frequently quite heightened emotions about this stuff um he presents his views in an extremely erudite way that's he always does and it's difficult to find any fault with his lines of argument so uh, you know i ain't going to touch that with a barge pole i respect his view and i respect his position um from my own position it's considerably simpler because when i come to do stuff for marvel or dc for instance i know going in I don't own any of this stuff. That's mm. part of the contract. It's never been a question mark the way that it was when a lot of Alan and his generation were doing this work. Um, I don't have the right to turn around and say I've been badly treated in the way that he would say he has. So, you know, um, yeah, I have I have no shade to shine <laughs> on, on his picture. Um, but from my perspective... It's a privilege to be able to do the work for hire because it means you get to play with the right the characters that you grew up with or that you have a certain fondness for. And it's very good for reaching elements of the readership that you otherwise couldn't. Mm. But as a writer, the great privilege is that you can be working on multiple things at once. And so I can be doing The Flash and Uncanny Spider-Man and at the same time doing some more coda for Boom and doing another image book and, and sort of being able to keep all of those plates spinning to keep my various different creative itches sufficiently scratched so yeah it's it's quite a nice game now is is there a hesitancy necessarily to use some of your best ideas and something that you know you'll not have the rights to later like if you had an idea for a character not maybe put it in something that you'll do you see and maybe use it for a creator own stuff or thing of that nature or is it I me mean, is there like um gamesmanship and or creative gamesmanship when writing for uh, a company like DC or marvel not so far. And I'll tell you why. Um, I've never had a shortage of ideas. It, it, there has never been a moment when I thought, wow, that's such a golden special idea that I dare not use it for some corporate entity. Um, in fact, it's always been the opposite sort of problem for me. I mean, uh, I maintain that this is the ideal form of comics because it's the sort of comics I love. But many of my detractors would say that I put too many ideas into a comic and therefore there's there's too much going on and it's a little bit exhausting. Um, when my daughter was born, she spent a year not sleeping. She was quite, quite sickly. And I was getting this. The story is going somewhere. I promise this isn't a massive tangent. Um, no worries. We were getting like two hours of sleep a night for months on end, like inhuman levels of sleep deprivation. And we went a bit potty and uh, sort of started to flirt with hallucination and psychosis. And, and just like it's incredible how quickly your ability to think normally, whatever that means, goes out the window when you become sleep deprived. For the purposes of this answer, what I discovered was that my ideas stopped. They just stopped. And I became quite panicked because this is my livelihood. This has never been a problem before. It's not like there's a switch where I wake up in the morning and say, I will have three ideas today. Click, click, click. It was just something that always happened. I would go for a walk or I would stare at a wall and ideas would come. And then they stopped. And I became quite frightened. I was like, I've got a spreadsheet somewhere that's got probably two years worth of decent ideas on it. But after that, that's it. Game over. And then... The day that, for reasons I won't bore you with, my daughter started sleeping right through. I woke up the morning after and it was like, doo, 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 straight back in again. All came straight running back. And and it's that simple. It's about being in the right headspace, being properly mm. rested. <laughs> and so far, they're not drying up. Uh, touch wood. Um, if the day ever comes when I find myself having one good idea a year, then yes, I might start. <laughs> 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 I do find it funny that you're the only person who worries about only having two years worth of good ideas. <laughs> Both of us are like, if we can get through the month, you know, we get through a month of a good idea. We're like, we, you know, something pretty good for now. <laughs> the funny thing is, I mean, I've, I've said there's no button, but you, you sort of can force ideas. I think if you just sit down and stare at a blank piece of paper until you hurt, something will come even if like, there's different strategies scribble away make some notes see what happens see what forms out of the nothingness uh oddly enough it happens when you stop wanting it to happen like if i sit and stare at a blank wall for an hour and just got nothing I'm like fuck it and i'll go and 
go for a walk and just try to think about nothing. It's that moment that the idea mm. will come. I suspect you need to build in empty space. Your brain needs to percolate about nothing so that it's unconsciously rumbling away. And that's what gets the, the sort of mechanism of idea to work. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> so how much also of writing is organization? I mean, you're, you have, you're writing multiple titles. You're deep in, it's your steeping continuity in all the, you know, especially like I said, uh, with your Spider-Man, uh, with you running with the flash, how easy is it to lose a continuity thread in what you're working or, or accidentally um, wind them together that you're mistaking what you were moving in one direction, one series that with what you're doing in another one. I mean, it's, I think it's a learnt skill rather than an innate skill. I think you become very good at, spinning the plates changing gears you know i'm at the moment i'm working on a slow burn horror book a high octane action book a street level crime book uh blah 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 and if you can't finish an issue of x and change gears to an issue of y then you're doomed you know that's that's the nature of work for it's the nature of any publishing but especially work for our publishing um you just learn it. I think you you get good at that. You speed up as you get older and as you get more experience, and then maybe you slow down again a little bit later when you start to realize that. I mean, at the moment, I'm working on too much. I've got like five books on the go, and there are times when I worry about the quality dipping because I'm having to bounce between things a little bit too much. I don't think it shows so far, and luckily that starts to wind down towards the end of this year, and I can start focusing a little bit more on things. I, I was talking to. Who was it? I think it was Gaiman. I got to hang out with Neil a couple of years ago while we were doing like um, the dreaming and all of that stuff. Now, don't quote me on this because I might be wrong. <laughs> Somebody, I think it was Neil, told me that when he was writing Sandman, he was taking like a couple of weeks per issue, presumably because the money was better <laughs> and you can afford to take a couple of weeks. Whereas these days, most writers in in like monthly publishing comics will will only get a week at most to work on a single issue. Um, and I know some who are doing like seven or eight books at a time, which just makes me sob at the very idea. So people move at different speeds, different sorts of comics take different amounts of time. It's often been an annoyance to me that the books that take me the least time are the ones that are the most mainstream, <laughs> therefore the most popular. Uh, a lot of editors will say to me, Sai, can you just dumb it down just a little bit? You don't have to work so hard. Just just take it a bit easier. Um, but no, I think I stick to my guns. I think that uh, this is a slightly separate conversation, but as a tangent, I I've noticed since I started getting into comics as a 16 year old, that there has been this gradual slide towards what we call decompression. And that, that in itself doesn't have to be a bad thing. Decompression can work extremely well, but my concern is that it's become such a key part of the comics vernacular that I now I now have fans who'll be like well I loved what you did but five panels on a page that's a lot that's quite hard work and I'm like dude if you want a comic that costs you five dollars and it takes you literally two minutes to read I can do that <laughs> but it feels like a con wouldn't you rather something that takes you 20 minutes to read and is full of highs and lows and interesting stuff that that takes you up and down and left and right and the more we normalize these books where very little happens and you give loads of space to almost nothing, the harder it is to roll back. Do you know what I mean? Like you go back and look at a comic that's 30, 40 years old and there's like 10 panels on a page and loads of, and, and that's probably too much by the standards of today. And I get it. The thing, the thing changes, the fashion changes, but I do worry at this kind of creeping idiocy um and i'm doing my very best <laughs> <to push it. laughs> so uh, well, go on. so in, in your in your opinion the the cause behind this is it more of a tiktok generation kind of thing that we're just a lack of um attention or is it because a lot of writing teams are only on their books for maybe five issues six issues seven issues and they don't have the time to really dive into anything so it's just kind of like throw it out there get you know get your sales move on I mean, I think it's all of those things. I think there's a there's a dozen different reasons. Um, there's also uh, the fact that you know, to to 
to be very blunt, the amount that writers and artists are being paid per issue hasn't changed since 1970. Hmm. So you have to do it. Whereas, as we know, the rest of the world has become considerably more expensive. So you have to work faster and harder. And one way to do that is to make sure that this monthly issue, this 20 page issue I'm doing, which once would have taken me two weeks to write and be chock full of plot and cool stuff that I've taken months to develop and think about. Now, somebody has to knock it out in three days. And that's, that's not my approach. I can't do it. It actually takes me longer to do something that's more decompressed than it than it takes me to do something that's more um, elaborate. But to, to, to go back a couple of steps to your question about continuity, generally, I rely on editors, you know, I, I do my homework, I try and immerse myself in as much of this stuff as possible. It's not possible for every potential writer of a brand to know everything about a character when they come aboard. Mm. I don't pretend to have read every single Flash comic there is. I've done my very best to read the, the good stuff. I, I, I really struggle to tell you my favorite Flash story, my favorite Flash writer or artist, because it's just sort of through a process of osmosis. I've just sort of sucked in as much as I possibly can. But if I mess up, my editor will tell me, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're writing Flash issue, legacy issue 801. So you only had 800 other issues to <laughs> catch up on, which could have been so now. much. <laughs> that, that's not counting the miniseries and the Justice League issues <laughs> and the um, annuals and spinoffs and all that. So, I mean, it's, this can't be that much time <laughs> needed. <laughs> In an afternoon and plow through. Right. <laughs> So to, to to go to the Flash, so like I said, you're the writer of the new Flash series. Um, technically issue one, but also legacy issue eight hundred one. Um, so how do you get involved with the Flash, and what was the what was the exciting pitch that either they gave to you to get you on the board, or that you gave to them to get yourself on board? It was the latter. Um, I can't speak to the thought processes behind the scenes, but um, my guess would be. So Jeremy Adams had done like a, a three-year run, an absolutely spectacular three-year run. You know, if 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 you haven't been reading The Flash and you're intending to come aboard when I start, then you should also go back and read some of his run because it's it's just the most joyous um celebration of what it is to be both a superhero and a person. It's it's mm. that. You know, it's that what made Peter Parker such a big deal at the beginning. You know, it's the sort of the juggling of the life with the spandex and, and it works really nicely. Um my assumption is that somewhere behind the scenes somebody said, well, that's a three year run. That's incredible by today's standards. There's a movie coming out. There's a TV show. If we don't do some big new direction now, whenever will we do you know what i mean mm. so I, I don't know how many people they went to and said do you have a pitch for the flash but i was certainly one of those people and i didn't expect to get it i was too busy <laughs> i was like well i'll i'll write a pitch that i would love to write but i don't think they'll go for it because it's mm. it's just a bit out there um and they went for it and I then, having having got the pitch and had a couple of days of panic, I then went and sort of immersed myself in in old Flash books and just took a second look right through Jeremy's run. And I, and I kind of came out the other end in a position not to give too much away about where my arc goes, but tonally, what I had pitched originally was quite a departure um, albeit a departure that I got to cleverly and slowly. I didn't want to just go, right, you've had three years of these awesome spandex stories about Wally West being a great guy and a family man and also a fantastic superhero. And then bang, we're just going to wipe all of that away and we're going to focus on a bunch of spooky cosmic horror and it's going to be different and weird, but also great because that would have pissed off a lot of people, quite rightly so. So what I intended to do and still intend to do is to honor the the momentum, honor the tone, and to jump back two steps, having gone back and read all this stuff, I'm more determined than ever to do this, to honor the, the family vibe, to honor the just a good guy vibe, and then to ratchet very slowly the mystery and ratchet the horror and it's there from the very first issue you can sense it 
around the outskirts, the shadows that sort of linger around Wally West's life. And we've got a huge cast, as as you know, you know, the Flash family is a, a really fun cast of characters, um, each of whom has their own uncertainty, their own mystery, which will gradually form this quite complicated tapestry building up to big moments. I mean, this is something that every writer says, but the um, American Gothic sequence from, from Saga of the Swamp Thing is the sort of the exemplar of the form where you do kind of unitary stories with exciting mysteries and endings which then gradually build this this broader tapestry so there's there's a lot of that vibe going on but it was so important to just focus as much as possible on the superheroing side of hmm. things um which is is not i mean it's funny that this is happening at the same time as doing the the spider-man stuff for marvel because it's not really something i've ever been given the opportunity to do before you know i think i'm in a lot of editors rolodex as the cerebral vertigo guy and they sort of come to me when they want a story about nightcrawler inventing a religion or whatever it may be so to get the opportunity to do some some good bold superheroing is quite exciting and then the Flash has had such a distinguished group of prior writers. Like you mentioned, Jeremy Adams, there's Joshua Williamson, Mark Way had a big one, Jeff Johns has a big one. And they, I mean, these have been very well received, very well remembered uh, lines. So has it been difficult to find your niche within that? Is, is there pressure in looking at what came before and go, I now need to add or be equal to what has um, now come before this character, these characters? I mean, yes, it's daunting. Um, as a result of them having greenlit my pitch specifically, the pressure is off to to try and emulate other voices. Now, apropos everything I just said, I'm actually determined to try and do a little bit of that anyway, because I don't want to just do this sudden rug pull shift in tone. Um, that said, you don't have to go very far in the, the flashback catalogue to find glimmers of the sort of stuff that I'm interested in, you know. Um, I'm quite fond of the the Morrison Miller run, you know, where they were just, uh, we're going back to ideas again, you know, God forbid my daughter stop sleeping because I'll be missing. <laughs> One of the really important things that you want out of a flashbook is ideas, lots and lots of ideas that are interesting and sciencey and they make you think sideways and they're all happening all at once and generally speaking what saves the day from this exciting cloud of big sci-fi thoughts isn't that a guy can run really fast it's that he can think fast or that he can think differently or that he has a family or that he is uh emotionally mature or whatever it may be and that's that's sort of what interests me about characters like wally you could argue that his ability to run really quickly is the least interesting thing about him. And and I mean, it's clearly not the least interesting thing about him, but it's not the most interesting thing about mm. him. And I think that makes a really vibrant, fertile soil to tell stories in. Now, also on, on this right, on the team with you is, I'm going to say the name probably right, Mike Diodato. Probably got That's it wrong. How, how I, I okay, it. so all right, cool. So I, I, well, at least I'm in the ballpark, or at least I can point blame somebody else. Like that's what he said. <laughs> uh, so I mean, and anyone who knows him, I mean, going back to, I think when I first, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, when I first learned about Mike Diodato, he was doing Glory for Image. So this is going back like for a while. I mean, he's a veteran. He's a, a star artist. When you know you have someone with that kind of pedigree behind you doing the artwork. What is how does that impact your approach? Do you are you able to kind of relax how you want to do something, or do you just kind of know that he has your back um, or visually? I mean, what is it like working with someone at that level? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, it, it's not a simple answer, I'm afraid. The well, okay, the simple answer is it depends on who you're talking about, and um, there's always a little bit of anxiety when you start working with somebody for the first time. Generally speaking, the best work I have done has been with artists with whom I have an existing relationship, with whom I've worked previously. I'm thinking about Matthias Bagara, with whom I work on Coda and Hellblazer, Aaron Campbell, who did the Hellblazer stuff with me. However, it is inevitable in all work for hire comics that at some time, 
an editor will say, we love your pitch, but we're going to put you together with this artist. And you you learn that if your pitch is strong and your editor is good, you devolve your instincts and your uh, desire to choose to other people. And generally speaking, it works out really well. And yes, there's always a, a, a kind of um, pragmatic marketing element behind these things because my name isn't as important as Mike's name is in, in this regard you know and, and that's okay because I will happily ride somebody's coattails <laughs> um luckily Mike is a consummate professional he's as versatile as you can be he spent years crafting a sort of he calls them Mondrian squares Mondrian lines which are it's like a, a, a quite unusual approach to panels and i'm not going to bore you with my <laughs> my whole sort of quasi magical scientific theory about the way that panels mess around with time and space but mike understands it instinctively and he utilizes um panel borders as a way of sort of progressing emotionally through a page which is quite quite wonderful and works very nicely in a flash comic specifically where there's so much um importance placed upon movement and speed and stillness i mean that's that's the the real key when you have a character who is moving so fast all the time you have to you have to understand how a beat can fall when everything stops and, and that's there's a lot of a lot of the ideas i'm playing with in this arc are about stopping and about just saying enough is enough um so yeah, he's he's fantastic. He uh, he's characters act extremely well. He takes notes amazingly well, which makes me happy because you can work with artists who really don't take notes very well. Um, yeah, no complaints. Uh, super excited about the way that he's designed a lot of the really big, strange things coming down the pipe. Um, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a very beautiful book. You know, I I, I wonder about the special powers that you apparently possess. When you were talking about Flash slowing down, you actually kind of froze and it kind of strobe down for a second. I was like, wow, he's really into this. <laughs> Look at yeah. this. So, so I was like, wow, he, yeah. he, 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 he's literally controlling it himself. <laughs> um, so anyway. Uh, Stop blurring and appear behind. Right. <laughs> so um, in the preview for the book that um, I read, it references a mind-shattering terrors is, is the phrase that's used. Now we just came out of the Night Terror storyline, or, or getting, or like halfway into the Night Terror storyline in DC. How close is what you're exploring with Flash connected to what we're just coming out of with Night Terrors? Um, not vitally so, I suppose is the right answer. So, I mean, full disclosure, I was I was planning the pitch and writing the first few issues of this before I knew anything about Night Terrors. Now. Luckily, uh, Alex Packnadel, who wrote the the Night Terrors Flash um, issues, is a is a close friend of mine. So we've been chatting and sharing a lot of ideas. So as is often the way with these sort of beautiful synergy in comics, retrospectively, some of the stuff that he's toyed with will absolutely be referenced and be important in some of the stuff that I'm dealing with. Now, um, it's not core. You don't have to have read Night Terrors in order to jump aboard. You certainly don't have to have read anything Flash oriented to jump aboard. I'm trying my hardest to make it all as user friendly as possible. But it is wonderful to be able to tip your hat to bygone stories, recent continuity. I always say that continuity at its best should be like an Easter egg to the dedicated fan rather than a hurdle to the novitiate. Um, if you can't drop into a story and love it, then the writer's doing something wrong. So, mm. um, Pagadel's tale is awesome. Um, the art's beautiful, and I think that yeah, we will we will be borrowing certain of his his lingering ideas in the future. Now, one other issue that the Flash, and not really an issue, but one situation the Flash does have um, be due to. Um, you know, the recent events of the last like 20 years, whatnot, is the issue of two flashes. You got Barry Allen Flash, who still exists as the Flash. You got Wally West, still existing as the Flash. Now, they both exist at the same moment, um, you know, in time. How do you just um, differentiate the Wally West as the Flash from what from Barry Allen Flash to make sure that when you're writing a Wally West story, that it's Wally West Flash, not Barry Allen Flash? 
Uh, that is a very good question. I can't answer it other than to say it will be answered. Okay. <laughs> it is very, very much part of the plan to um, to not ignore that. You know, it, it would be very easy to just sort of pretend that's an inconvenient reality, but it's okay because this is a Wally book and not a Barry book, so we're just not going to talk about it. That is not what I'm doing. There is a, a far larger tapestry being put together and that is part of the tapestry but i'm but i'm not giving you any more than that <laughs> <laughs> i mean i like to, and as you as you referred um reference earlier about the flash family how the size of it you also have um impulse uh, uh kid flash the, the the other wally uh there's, there's a lot there how yep. is is it too many characters to make sure each one has enough time to be their own character no, I, I think it's um, it's weirdly liberating. I mean, you must remember I, I've spent the past few years doing like X Men comics, where the the necessity to feature every part of a team is quite high, you know, and that can be that can be exhausting because you, well, I want to go deep into the psyche of a, a core character, and if you have eight hundred of the bloody things, then there's no time to dig deep into into all of their lives um the approach with flash and the extended flash family is far more flexible because you focus on usually the main character not exclusively there there will i can tell you be issues further down the line where wally is not the central character but he's always part of our story um Generally speaking, we focus on Wally and we touch base with the other characters and what they're doing. And some of them will all come in at once. Some of them will be referenced in the background here and then pop up over there. And if I'm doing my job right, I'm gently teasing out multiple plot threads at once, sometimes in a way that won't even be obvious, so that a, a very innocuous appearance in issue X becomes a really important thing in issue Z. Um, and yeah, it, it also means that I can pivot. If I feel like I really enjoy dealing with this character, I can focus on them for a little while. This is all assuming I get more than six issues, which is not not certain in today's climate. But let's yeah. let's assume I've got a little bit more to play with. Um, and that's wonderful to, to sort of be able to say, I have a cast of characters. I can dip in and out of their lives as long as there is always a, a, a sort of central thread generally speaking that's wally's thread um yeah it's really nice and it, it's kind of a little bit like i mean hey i'm a father you sort of you do get used to to sort of spreading your attention around in a, in a kind of family sense but you, you know the world is still being seen through your eyes you can't change your perspective but you can change the different ways that you borrow other people's pictures of the mm. world um yeah, I'm really enjoying it. And and there's something to be said for all the different takes on on the sort of speedster archetype. You know, I said it before about Wally, and, and it's true for all of them. Being able to run fast is not the interesting thing about most of these characters. It, it's kind of what brings them all together, although most of them are related to each other. <laughs> We've seen that fiendishly complicated family tree. It's uh it's mind blowing. But um yeah, it's it's about a collection of people who choose to be affectionate and mm. collaborative and and to fight the good fight together because they are aware that they are greater than the sum of their parts. Um, I'm very fond of Max Mercury, for instance. Like it's one of my very favourites because the rest of them are are sort of heroic science fiction archetypes, whereas Max has that whole kind of hokey spiritual thing which I find quite useful for the, the purposes of my story, which, you know, not too much of a spoiler. I've always been fascinated by the notion of the speed force, which like it's, it's been defined about 8,000 times and no two definitions <laughs> agree with one another. It's like a, it's like a living contradiction. Um, and that to a, to a writer who enjoys subverting ideas, bringing big ideas to the table, messing with genre, something that is that big and that important to the the kind of lore of of this group of characters but that is so convolutedly imprecise 
is like a red rag to a bull you know I want to go towards that and I want to stick things in it and I want to see what happens so a lot of that is going on but it always through a very human filter now another um complication in my I mean as far as I know I've never done it is running for the flash is the flash power um I, I I've had the I guess I have too much free time in my hand I've had debates with people and, I, and I've tried to argue with them the difficulty in fighting someone who moves quicker then the the visual light will hit your eyes, can process the information, and let, allow the brain to re, let you react to the problem in front of you. He's faster than your ability to react to him. That's quite a power. Now, not just I mean, even beyond that, I mean, at the speed that he moves, a slap could shatter your atomize your brain. You know, I mean, he's he's quite he's way more powerful than most writers give him credit for. How hard is it to find? I mean, his role gallery is famous. I mean, um, you know, Heat Wave, um. Uh, Captain Cold. But at the same time, he should be able to beat them pretty easily because he can move quicker than the gun is going to do anything. How yep. hard is it to create sub- substantial villains to fight a guy who is, in many ways, the, one of the most powerful characters in the entire DC universe? Um, I don't think it's hard. I think it's uh, it's a fun challenge. Um, there's two answers. One is that um, you can, without too much hard work you can manipulate the extent to which your Flash character is unstoppable. They are, generally speaking, able to move faster than anything else, uh, think very fast, hit like a wrecking ball, blah, 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 all the things you said. And yet, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they haven't got to top speed yet. You know, like, I think... It's canonical that Wally can break the speed of light, but only very rarely. So it's not like he's it's not like he's moving faster than light all the time. There's a lot of sort of slightly awkward pseudoscientific stuff that you can dig into to do with auras and manipulating space time. And funnily enough, I've done a lot of homework separately to all this about space time. And there's some really in the real world, if the flash passed you by, it would be like approaching the event horizon of a black hole you would Mm. be there's a there's a term in science called spaghettified because whereas your matter can't move beyond a certain speed of light space time itself can the space that you occupy can travel faster than light even though your material cannot so bodies end up being spaghettified which i think is a wonderful term anyway all of that is to say that you can have a lot of fun with it as long as you are playing by the rules you start by establishing the rules you make sure that there's always a good reason for these characters not to be essentially gods um and then you can access drama the other side of the equation is that why not play with the characters being gods why not let that be a thing that can happen sometimes Mm. and raise the stakes to accommodate and and that's been done more than once i'm i'm sort of playing with both of those directions in in very different ways um as so hey the thing that made my name in superheroes was a a series called x-men legacy which was all about legion uh charles xavier's son who is essentially a god he's the the most powerful mutant there is in the world but his crisis is not to do with who he's punching this week or which villain has decided that they're going to have a fight. It's to do with his internal conflicts. He's beyond beyond stronger and more powerful than any other character. And yet he is mentally unwell. He's riven with his own, um, his own conflicts. The same should be true of all ridiculously powerful superheroes. And, and I think that's what Jeremy did so well. It's what makes a lot of the best Flash runs really stand out is that it's not about who's Flash going to punch and how do they get away from him and what happens when they have a fight. It's behind that. That's the stuff that we enjoy seeing in the foreground. But behind that, it's about, is he feeling heartsick? What's he missing? Is he tired? How many things is he trying to keep spinning? While he's doing this, what's going on at home? You know, that whole level of... um, he can run faster than anything, and yet he's just a man with the same human level worries that any human person has. That's where the drama lies, I think. And you can, mm. you can twist that. If you if you need to have those sort of super villainous threats, it's not because they're trying to run faster than he is, it's because they know he's a man. Mm. 
Now, one thing that also seemed that was teased in the some of the previews is that you're uh, is the idea that he's gonna be learning to use um, the the speed force and his powers in new and different ways. So, how mm -hmm. fun has it been to try to come up with new ways to use his powers? And can you tease anything about like what are we are we looking at powers that are well beyond what we think about with the Flash, or are these just kind of like um, adaptations of what we already know that he can do? So, can you tease a little bit of that? Um, I really can't be very specific. Uh, I guess the the sort of the tease. Um, at some point, somebody says to him, "You've barely begun to scratch the surface. Stop trying to run in straight lines and start stepping sideways." And that's that's just a little hint of of the sort of stuff that we're we're getting into. It's about seeing the speed force in a very holistic way. It's not just something that you can tap into that makes you go really quickly. It's something much more mysterious and much more interesting as a result of being mysterious, which, I mean, I guess the, the interesting thing to tease is that there are all these characters, heroic and villainous, who in a multitude of different ways have tapped into this mysterious force that none of them fully understands. And nobody has ever stopped and said, do you think there might be consequences for <laughs> tapping into this bizarre, strange force that nobody understands? Do you think that might be a clever thing to do? Or do you think we might need to maybe understand it a bit better first? And they're like, nah, we can save the world, carry on. So that's that's some of the, the sort of the interesting stuff that I was thinking about when I, when I was first suggested that I pitch for this story. Um, there are many existing examples of people who have, in an exploratory, well-intentioned way, encountered resources that can be exploited, which they've regretted. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting example for me. Is it like an o o Oppenheimer <laughs> kind of situation? Um, maybe they shouldn't have built them. Yeah, everybody's doing this. There's a little bit of that going on, yeah. Now, one thing I think was Josh and Williamson's run that he kind of dove into was the other forces. Like he had a, a strong force and I can't remember the other force, but a bunch of other forces. Are they in play or are we kind of like dancing mm -hmm. around? Because I felt like once they were kind of introduced um, and he left the run, they kind of just kind of forgot that they existed after that. Is that something that's also in play or is it that's kind of a storyline that we're going to kind of let it's being let to rest with that um, run? I'm not I'm not going to ignore anything that is relevant um they will certainly be dealt with let's put it like that they will be they will be referenced and um creatively worked into my tapestry so as we mentioned a little bit earlier um runs of ongoing titles right now are incredibly short so how far ahead have you been told that to plan for and how long do you are you intending to be on board for uh, I mean, I'm I've got enough enough material to go for at least two years and and hopefully more. So you know, I'm being ambitious about that. Um, I'm I mean, hey, there's there's nothing to say really. I at this point, it's keep going. Nobody has told me make sure you wrap it up by six. Um, I, it's too early to know what numbers are like for one. So so there isn't really any any good gossip to share on that regard. Um, I think we'll. I think we'll go strong. I think we'll certainly get past that first arc. Um, I'll be screwed up if we don't, because I'm <laughs> I'm certainly intending to get beyond that. My ideas are far bigger than than I want to try to constrain. Um, beyond that, I don't know. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time I've been told to wrap up within you know three issues. I don't think that's going to happen this time, but I I can make it happen if I have to. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Saberi, like I said, I'm looking forward to what you do with the Flash. It's um, it's is it September twenty? Yeah, twenty seventh, I believe. Twenty seventh. Maybe it's because I DC is Tuesdays these days, isn't it? So I guess that's uh, let's see, that's the twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. All right. Yeah. Very cool, Mr. Saberi. It's been an absolute honor to talk, talk to you, sir, without the Flash. And hopefully, when we get some more issues in that we can discuss directly, you can can come back on the show. I'll stop teasing you with answers I can't give. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you'll just tease you with different answers that you can't get for the next six issues that come after That's the right. post. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a window of mystery. Yeah, no, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a great day, sir. <laughs>